Well, I want to thank you for joining me today for our Tuesday Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, bless us today with your presence, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I want to kind of review where we've been because we're skipping ahead a few chapters to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Remember, we are looking at what the appointed lectionary lessons are for Sunday morning in the epistle lessons. And for this week, it was 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So we miss a few chapters. <clears throat> and with Paul, that's kind of a problem because you miss a little bit. You kind of miss where he's going in his argument. So let's start with this. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Remember, Paul had a church that was on the brink of killing each other. He told me, you guys got to get your act together and realize it's about love. That's, of course, what that famous love passage is all about. Two people that are ready to kill each other. <clears throat> Maybe it's appropriate for marriage counseling later in a marriage rather than on wedding day. Uh, how do we love each other when we're ready to kill each other? That's what basically 1 Corinthians is about. Paul had hoped to get their theology straight by coming out with uh, visiting them, was not able to do that. So he wrote a second book, 2 Corinthians. And the very first thing he wants to make sure that they know it's not about you. See, the Corinthians kind of started making, you know, making up a little bit and getting together a little bit. <clears throat> but now what they did is they started turning against everybody else outside of the church. Oh, well, you guys don't measure up to us, you know. You need to be more like us if you want Jesus. And Paul needs to convince them it's not about Jesus, or not about you, it's about Jesus. And after all, you're just a frail jar of clay. You're fragile, you break, you're worn, but don't panic about it. You're in God's care, so there's no need to panic, but you're not getting to heaven because of anything that you've done, by what God has done. However, even as a jar of clay, we have been called to be partners in the reconciling work of Jesus Christ, and what a privilege it is. So it's not about us, it's about Jesus, and we have the privilege of participating in it. That's the direction of his argument. Then, the two chapters that we kind of skip, uh, one of the chapters is about repentance. Now, repentance is not this religious word, repent or go to hell. Repent is simply this, I'm going in this direction, and it's really causing me harm. Just turn around and go the other direction. That's what repentance is. I think it's a much more gentle word than what we seem to think it is. Uh, repent. Turn your back on the way in which you're going because that way was causing you harm. If you're hurting each other with your words, turn your back on those words. Stop being so sarcastic towards one another. Start loving one another. This is a new way, a new day, a new age that God has created for us. So this, I hope, is helpful to get our brains in sync with Paul the argument and the direction he's going in for a lesson for today. All right, so you got that. Let's turn to our lesson. So remember, he's just asked the Corinthians to do something new, to turn in a different direction. And so we get Paul, beginning of chapter 8, and you kind of miss this. Paul actually starts talking about uh, the churches of Macedonia and how generous they've been, even though they're so impoverished compared to the people in Corinth. Corinth would have been a very wealthy city compared to Macedonia. And the people would have been quite wealthy. It's a, it was a hopping metropolitan area at the time and so forth. So he's, Paul was saying, you know what? These folks out of love for one another, they gave generously to the people who were hurting. All right? And so they gave abundantly out of their you know, lack of means, they didn't have much, but they shared with the saints who were desperately in need, who were starving to death. And so now he turns to the Corinthians, verse 7. So now, as you excel in everything, so Paul, I love Paul's psychology. He's saying, we know that you're going to excel. See, Paul sees them as a 10. He knows that the Corinthians have been acting like real jerks, okay? But that's not who they are. He says, this is who you are. You're a 10 out of 10. I'm going to see you as a 10. I'm expecting that you're going to fulfill what God has created you to fulfill, to be who God has created you to be. This is how God sees us. Okay, so Paul is 
kind of doing that psychology. So now, as you excel in everything, I expect you're going to excel because I know how good you are and how good you can be. Both in faith and faith, in speech and knowledge in utmost eagerness and in our love for you, so we want you to excel in this generous undertaking. So again, the undertaking is the giving. There are people who are hurting and they need to be fed. This is something that goes on all the time throughout the world. There's always somebody hurting, always somebody who needs to be fed or cared for or bound up. Paul goes on, I don't say this as a command. Remember, there's only one command that Jesus has for us. Love. And we are supposed to try to figure out how that is best implemented in our particular situation. So I can't make a commandment over it. This is one of the faults of the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. Everybody seems to think that's the gold standard. At least some Christians do. The gold standard of law. That's, that's just... Not true. This is the gold standard of law. Love one another as you've been loved. Okay? That's it. There's no uh, do this, don't do that, don't do that. There's no rule that you can make that fits every single circumstance. It's the problem with written laws and rules. We see that in our country, in every country. That's why all laws, which might seem to work well for a time, become quite unjust as the circumstances transform or changed. So if we operate our lives by love, it's a one-size-fits-all fit, gift. Now, it won't always look the same. It morphs and transforms depending on the relationship you have with the person and uh, the circumstances of life. So, I mean, I love my wife, but I love her differently than I love the members of our congregation. And I love them differently than I do people who are not members or people who are on my track team or my kids that I'm coaching. We are all, we all have different relationships. I wouldn't treat my wife in the same way that I treat my kids on the track team. I love my kids on the track team very much. But my wife, I think, would get kind of annoyed with me if I started acting like a coach every single day when I was at home. That wouldn't be cool. All right? So love fits a variety of circumstances and relationships. And so Paul's not going to make a commandment. He's not going to tell them, you've got to do this. But what he is saying is, search your heart. How has God called you to love in this particular circumstance? Verse 9. <clears throat> you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> All right. So... Paul's going to say, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you to give that there's people who are hurting and need to be fed. But I'm going to tell you what God has done for you. Remember how he told you Paul is kind of like that mother who would say, well, you know, I'm not going to tell you you got to do this. Of course, I'm the person that gave you birth, and I'm the person that did this for you. And, and wash your ears when they're dirty, and I'm the one that paid for your education. But it's okay. You do what you think is right. <laughs> okay. Paul, remember in our week, last week's lesson, that's kind of what he did. He was kind of like that mom that put that guilt trip on you. Well, Paul's now twisting it a little bit tighter and putting you a guilt trip on us by saying, you know what Jesus has done for you. I'm just asking you to give a little bit of the money that you have. Oh, but never mind the fact that Jesus has given far more than you could ever give in return. <laughs> All right. For you know the generous act of Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor. So that by his poverty he might become rich. We become wealthy because Jesus poured himself out for us. Now, Paul's saying, I'm not asking you to impoverish yourself. I'm just asking you to give out of the great wealth that you have. Just a portion. It's like that old story about the chicken and the pig. Chicken and the pig wanted to go in a restaurant business together, and the pig kind of shakes his head and said, I'm committed. You're, you might be invested, but I'm committed. <laughs> okay, I've got to give it all for this. Are you kidding me? It's not a fair relationship. 
All right. Verse 10, in this manner I'm giving my advice. It is appropriate for you began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it. Okay. He's saying, you know, you started with this idea about love and you got kind of turned on about it a little bit and you started maybe giving a little bit generously. The work isn't done. Keep giving. Fulfill the, the commitment that you started a year ago. It's easy, you know, sometimes when we... Uh, when we get excited about something, or we, we turn over a new leaf, or whatever the case might be, uh, that we, we get excited about helping somebody. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, for instance, in this pandemic, people were very generous right at the start, caring for people who are poor by giving generously of their money or of their food and so forth. But that starts to become a little bit harder as the pandemic went on. People didn't give quite as generously. They start hoarding a little bit more. You know, or maybe it just, it's no longer, the novelty is worn off. Okay, whatever the case might be. And so people become a little bit more stingy. Paul's saying, keep that spirit of generosity once you found Jesus Christ, keep that spirit of generosity. Remember what it was like when you first found that relationship with Christ, or better yet, Christ found you, and your life was transformed. Keep that spirit within your heart. Okay? So this manner, uh, so now finish doing that good work that you started a year ago. So your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. Now that's actually a really important word. Complete it according to your means. Now, Jesus poured himself out 100%. Paul is not asking people to give 100% of your wealth to help those who are poor. Because what happens to you? Oh, you become poor. You become part of the problem. You, uh, you know, we need to help you. Okay? So you give according to your means. You don't impoverish yourself. Only Jesus did that. You don't have to be Jesus. Just give according to your means. What do you have? Let's go on. <clears throat> For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, according to one's means. Not according to what one does not have. Don't go into debt. Don't put yourself in a position where you can't feed your family by your giving. Give according to your means. I don't mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you. It is a question of a fair balance between you, your present abundance, and their need. So again, we look at our means and we see, I have more than what I have, what I need. I have more. That's me. They have less. They're poor, them. Hmm, what's the solution for that? Oh, that's right. I give some of what I have to help alleviate their suffering. I don't give all of everything that I have. I don't become poor for them. Only Jesus does that. I don't have to be Jesus. But if I've been richly blessed by Jesus, I give generously of what I have received. So your present abundance and their needs is balanced so that their abundance may be for your, your need in order that there may be a fair balance. So in other words, you give, when you've got more, you give to them so that they are fulfilled and have what they need. There might be a time where you're going to be at need and they'll be able out of their abundance to help you. You help them through this hard time. There's, they'll help you when your time has come because that's what love does for each other. We don't count the cost. I mean, we don't sit here and, and balance our checkbooks and say, well, I gave more than what you gave. No. Take a look at what you have. If you've got an abundance, give generously. As it is written, the one who is much did not have too much, and the one who has had little did not have too little. That's kind of a nice little aphorism. Basically, the person who had little was basic. It's a it was filled by the person who had much. So now they were even. They shared together. 
I do want to warn you because I actually do have a person who watches who is politically a, a communist um, and believes that these types of lessons are about communism. Let's equalize the salaries. That's not what it is. Because remember, did you hear what Paul said? I'm not making a commandment and telling you what to do. The reason for your giving should be motivated by love. In communism, giving is motivated by the threat of force and violence against you. The law says you have to give. So as soon as we add human-made law that makes you give, it's no longer love. It ceases to be love. That's not the kingdom of heaven. Communism is not of Jesus. Now, by the way, neither is capitalism. Okay? I don't care what the politics of the world are. None of the politics of the world represent Jesus. Doesn't matter what the politics you live in, we can still love. God has blessed you. Be a blessing. Not because you have to, but out of gratitude for the love of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks again for the blessings of this day. For the politics of the kingdom of heaven, which begin and end with one word, love. Love is gifted to us through the Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so what a privilege it is that we can part be participants in the good news of Jesus. And we can spread his love in the world by loving one another. We just give you thanks for that privilege in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.